Okay, sorry, a little late today. Um, one of the things I was trying to do is to sort out the connection between my computer and our internet so that I can actually have the lectures a little bit more quickly, um, unlike what happened on Friday, which was a real mess. So um, hopefully that will get taken care of um, in the next little period of time. Last Monday of the term. What? Next week is Memorial Day. We don't have class. Yay! Long weekend. More time to study. More time to write exams. Good. <laughs> of course. Obviously. Okay, but just to get us all back in the mood, what do we need to do? Yay! Of course. So, um, what seems to regulate maintenance of latency in HSV1? Removal of segment, transition of latency genes, transition of VP16, translation of ICP0, or degradation, degradation of ICP4. this time. So maybe I told you something wrong when I said if in doubt answer VP16 um, because <laughs> VP16 transcription is only going to happen when? Ah, transcription of VP16 late because this is what's going to be made into going into the tegument and being part of the final structure of the virion. So it's only going to be very, very late and actually when you're producing virus particles. So it can't be VP16. Um, nobody liked ICP0 or ICP4. What are those? And those would be things that I wouldn't be surprised to see something about in an exam. They're transcriptional regulators um, for mostly the middle and late genes. Um, and ICP4 has that. Um, as I was overhearing over here, that auto-regulatory function. Uh, so removal of the tegument, nobody liked that, but fortunately that's not the correct answer. The correct answer is this transcription of the latency genes, because it's the lat transcripts, the latency <coughs> genes, those. And the couple of important things here as far as the question, again, thinking about reading Stedman's questions for exams, um, it's maintenance of latency. So it's not making latency in the first place, it's keeping latency going. Okay. Yes, no, huh? Huh? Okay. Okay, so today we're going to talk about pox viruses, and I'm going to show you a video because it's Monday and we need to watch videos on Mondays. Uh, so, uh, pox viruses. Um, again, this is continuing our wonderful progression from the little tiny ones, the papovas and the papillomaviruses, up to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Wednesday, we'll talk about you know, retroviruses, which is kind of silly, but um, then we'll do the mini viruses, these absolutely ginormous viruses, also known as the megaviruses. Um, so again, getting bigger, more complicated, again, bigger not just in terms of the virion size, but also in terms of the genome, and not surprisingly, when you've got more genome, you can put more stuff into it. Um, and what that means is that these viruses are getting closer and closer to being completely autonomous, i.e. they don't need very much at all of cellular machinery. 
Um, what do all viruses, however, need for cellular machinery? Ribosomes, and then also, as far as we can tell, metabolism, because they don't seem to be able to metabolize by themselves, but they certainly modify that. Um, of course, most people, when they think about pox viruses, unless they're enlightened in this class, um, think about pox viruses in terms of disease, and particularly smallpox. And the reason that we don't have to worry about smallpox anymore, of course, has to do with vaccines. And so we spent a little while talking about vaccines and the whole development of vaca, the cow, which is actually not the host for vaccine at all, but that's a different story. Um, and then <clears throat> the other thing which is incredibly useful in terms of these viruses is using them as models to study production of messenger RNA, because it turns out that Again, not dissimilar to things like adenovirus when the major late promoter was how we learned a lot about how transcription is regulated, the SV40 origin of replication, a lot about how replication happens. Um, these are really nice models for understanding messenger RNA production um, in particular. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing, if we have a chance at the end, we may get back and talk a little bit about how people are now using this smallpox vaccine as the basis for producing vaccines against a whole bunch of other things. Um, and we've actually looked at that in my lab to some extent. We took Vaccinia and we're treating it um, to try and think about other vaccines. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're really good at making messenger RNAs and whatever messenger RNA you happen to put in. That you know, could be, say, the GP protein from Ebola or something like that. So um, today, vaccination, 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 vaccination. Um, but also a couple of important things about these <clears throat> excuse me, viruses from the important stuff, i.e. molecular. Um, they have these really interesting hairpin ends on their genomes. Uh, yes, they're quote-unquote linear genomes, but whenever Stedman does the air quotes, that means it's not really quite right. Um, and that's because I, you can also think of these as genomes as being single-stranded or single-molecule, getting back to all single-molecule, that's completely complementary to itself. So it turns out that it's just one continuous strand of DNA that then base pairs all the way along, with little exception at the end, because you've got to make that turn to get round to the opposite strand. Um, and we'll take a look at that. It's a really fascinating structure. And it turns out to be probably very important for replication, which is not unlike the replication happening with the really tiny single-stranded DNA viruses of eukaryotes, also known as parvoviruses, exactly. So the replication is probably actually really pretty similar that way, which is interesting. We've got these really, really tiny genomes and these ginormous genomes um, replicating in very, very similar fashions. Um, there is absolutely no splicing that happens in the messenger RNAs of these viruses, and that should tell you a little bit already about how they're replicating and how dependent they are on cellular machinery. Um, and then also, we'll talk a little bit about these two structures. Yes, they look really similar to each other, but this one's got an extra membrane on the outside, um, as opposed to this one. Um, and these are two different forms of the virion, um, both of which are infectious. Um, interestingly, um, this is the only virus that we're going to talk about here, which actually has two membranes on the outside. So this membrane that has the blue proteins in it and the one that has the yellow proteins in it on as well. We'll take a little bit more <clears throat> look at that when we get there at the end. So classic outline, um, this process. I didn't highlight anything here because, well, it's kind of everything or nothing is to be emphasized here. Um, origins, of course, we'll talk a little bit about disease, and that's where we get the fun video. <clears throat> um, the genome, again, is this, you know, linear or circular self-complementary genome. Um, replication, because of that's interesting, and then the transcription, as it turns out, is almost all viral. So practically no influence here of the cellular machinery, and then getting out has to do with this multiple extra membranes um, around the outside. These virions clearly don't have a typical icosahedral or helical structure. They kind of look like blobs, although they mention them as brick-like structures. I'm not sure how you would stack all these things up um, relative to each other, but <clears throat> that's what the virions look like. Pox viruses, of course, infamous for disease, viral disease or smallpox. People go back, they look at mummies. Uh, they've actually found some of these 
things that look like potential pox virus disease literally <laughs> back, I think actually it's more than 10,000 years ago, um, for you know, really pretty obvious looking and unfortunately really kind of yucky looking um, disease here. Smallpox, now we know, is caused by the variola virus and probably the reason that most of us here um, don't speak Native American languages because um, smallpox was brought over from Europe um, by the conquerors or whatever you want to call them here um, and really killed off um, certainly most of the advanced civilizations um, in the New World um, when it came. And it's pretty clear that smallpox killed way more than the conquistadors did uh, because the uh, you know, disease amounts, um, there was basically no way that they could control these kinds of things. Um, and that was a lot to having to do with the fact that there was no pre-existing immunity. And now why there wasn't um, pox viruses in the Americas is a really interesting question, and no one really knows why that is. Um, interesting historical question. Uh, well, actually, which reminds me, total aside, um, I don't know if anyone is going to the talk this evening um, on viral outbreaks in West Africa and control thereof. Um, interesting talk from the history department at 6 o'clock. I'll, I'll try and remember to post that on, um, <clears throat> on D2L. Uh, but yes, um, why is smallpox so nasty? Because about you know, one in four people die if they get it as an adult and um, up to 40% for younger uh, people. So this um, really is a very, very, very nasty disease. Um, the progression, they go through it completely in the book. I'm not going to go into it I'm in terms of more details there. But very, very, very high mortality rate, but also highly infectious. And one of the things that <clears throat> people have found is that the actual theory on itself is incredibly stable. You can purify active virus from scabs that people have collected. In fact, they found some in an NIH lab uh, like a year, year and a half ago, uh, about 80 years old, uh, which was still had active virus in it. So um, these are some very, very, very stable virus particles. Yeah? So why weren't all the Europeans wiped out at a time of the conquistadors that was their natural immunity or did they? Yeah, so we'll get to that in just a second. So um, it turns out that one, if you survive the infection, you're now resistant to super infection. Um, and so that's probably why um, the small percentage, well actually not that small a percentage, you know, 75% survive. Uh, but the, the mortality rate among the Native Americans seemed to be even higher um, than this. And this is in the, the European populations here. Um, and of course, people are also very concerned about this. If you've got something which is very stable, um, could potentially be transferred, um, synthetic biology, you can make these potentially. And so there's a lot of discussion about um, this process. Now, fortunately, there's a really good vaccine for smallpox. Uh, <clears throat> and probably at least as importantly, the reservoir species is humans. So as far as we know, smallpox, the variola virus, only infects humans. And so this is one of the major reasons that we've been able to basically eliminate smallpox. Um, there are a couple of sites where they still have active variola, um, two that we know of. Um, and um, I'll get back and talk about those more. Patrick, do you have a question? OK. Uh, <clears throat> There are a number of other pox viruses, um, but one of the other famous ones is the myxoma virus, which was introduced into Australia to try and get rid of the rabbits. Um, of course, like the Europeans and smallpox, the rabbits are now resistant to myxoma. So now you've got a bunch of resistant rabbits running around Australia. Um, <clears throat> the uh, viruses which are most studied now in terms of pox viruses are the vaccinia virus, and I, I love this here, unknown reservoir host. Yeah, because we're actually not quite entirely sure where vaccinia came from. Um, was originally used by Edward Jenner in the 1790s uh, and thought it was coming from the milkmaids, but it turns out that cowpox actually is just as closely related to variola as it is to vaccinia, so it's not entirely clear um, where this came from. Yeah? So if humans are the main host 
Oh, oh so for season. sorry for the for some of these other ones like um, foul pox or cowpox, etc. Did you say just smallpox? There was more. Species. It's only variola. Yeah. So variola, it's just humans. So yeah, sorry for the other uh, again pox viruses and chicken pox. Of course, is not a pox virus. Herpes virus. Uh, but <clears throat> it's yeah that that variola itself is only infecting humans. Um, and it also makes it a little bit harder to study because you have to have, you know, human cell cultures, et cetera, if you're going to be working on it. Yeah, Trevor. Are we getting good from the virus? Like, is there a reason why it's only humans? Why it's only humans? Um, that's, in fact, a really good question, and I was going to look it up. I was thinking about it for my lecture today, um, but didn't have a chance to. It's sort of, you know, since we've got this ridiculously autonomous virus, why is it just infecting humans? That does seem like a really interesting question. And, I asked myself that question and I didn't get an answer to it. So, <laughs> um, but that being said, um, let's move on and talk about vaccination. Um, so, smallpox because it killed so many people and was pretty widespread throughout the world. Um, people had figured out, um, as <clears throat> we just heard here, um, that once you'd been infected you were resistant to being infected again. And people took advantage of this, and they had you know, the equivalent of chickenpox parties, um, where you would have a person who was infected. You get the scabs off of that person and use those to infect other people. Um, and this was called variolation. So variola, again, being the virus, and just using the virus to infect someone. And very often this was actually babies because, you know, babies, you can always make more babies, which seems a little crazy. I'm sure you would have issues if you tried to get that past your institutional review board here. Uh, but that was the process as, you know, get them infected. They don't have too much disease. Some of them are definitely going to die in the process, but that seemed to be the process. And so um, you still have a 1% fatality rate, which is pretty ridiculous in terms of a disease, you know, kill off 1% of your population to save the other 99%. Again, these are ethical questions that we're not going to get into for the rest of the course. Um, but it was about that time, um, and this is actually pretty well known, well before Jenner, um, that this happened, and in fact, many people did this. Um, they would treat themselves with smallpox, small amounts to try and protect themselves from future disease. Uh, Edward Jenner, noticed, again, this is you know, how real some of these things are, some of it may be legend, some of it may be legit, that milkmaids didn't get smallpox. Hmm. Well, they had the beautiful, clear skin. That's why, you know, everyone liked the milkmaids. Uh, but <clears throat> what he thought, well, okay, they, but they did have the beautiful, clear skin on their faces because they hadn't had smallpox and had all these pox that had then fallen off, but often their hands had these pox on them. And cow's udders had these pox on them. Cowpox, presumably, that was that they were getting resistance that way. Um, Edward Jenner then, again, in clinical trials that would never be accepted these days, um, inoculated a child with this vaccinia, he called it, and then tr uh, did variolation, so treated the kid. And probably the kid would have been treated with variolation anyway. Um, but then found absolutely no disease whatsoever. And through this, um, said, okay, well, instead of variolation, which is using the variola virus, we'll call this vaccination from vaca the cow. And so that's the whole vaccination comes from cows. You know, that's where the name actually comes from. So uh, after this happened, um, and in fact, a lot of the vaccinations that happened in the U.S., you notice, you know, 1790s is about the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, people literally sent infected people on ships over to the U.S. so that they could, again, could harvest their scabs and do variolation. Um, and they infected people with cowpox and then got them to try and come over and then use the cowpox because they couldn't just ship the virus around. So um, just amazing stories. It's really cool stuff here, and I can post some more of that. Uh, but now, after this had been going on, literally for tens of generations, we now have the vaccinia virus, and that's now what is being used for smallpox vaccination, um, and most of the people working on them in the lab. Uh, again, it's 
just as related to cowpox as it is to variola. Where it actually came from is kind of anybody's guess. The latest I heard is people thought it actually was in horses originally. How that happened, we have no idea. Um, but because of this really good vaccination, um, smallpox has been almost completely and utterly eliminated. Um, there are two places um, where they still have it that we know of, CDC and Vector, which is the Russian equivalent of the CDC. And every year they have a meeting of the, what they call the Advisory Council on Variola Research, where people from the CDC and from Vector get together and say, do we put the vials into the autoclave at the same time with observers from both places and hit the on button? Or do we keep the virus around? And the answer is, you keep the virus around. And um, one of these people actually made that decision or helped advise that decision. Um, trust me, it wasn't this guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one, Antonio Alcani, um, who's a Spanish pox virologist, um, who was our host at a meeting um, at Atapuerca, which as you may have seen at the beginning here, um, some of the earliest hominid fossils. Um, that particular skull is a model of a 400,000-year-old um, hominid, um, probably homo uh, <clears throat> skull here. Um, but the meeting that they had literally in January of this year said, um, we're only going to use the wild-type variola. So this is the active smallpox virus, which is kept at CDC and at Vector, um, for antivirals. Um, and the reason for doing antivirals and really being interested in looking at antivirals is having a lot to do with the fact that synthetic biology has made so many strides in the last few years that you could literally make smallpox, probably, just by putting together bits and pieces of DNA, put it together in the whole genome, and end up with smallpox. People can buy oligosynthesizers, reprogram them to actually make some of these things. So what they strongly suggested in this last meeting, and the PDF is here, it's only 60 odd pages if you want to read it, uh, is that people should start to be more prepared and also tell more primary care people to look out for these kinds of pox lesions, just in case something is coming along, something has happened. They also want to get experts in synthetic biology involved in the, the whole panel here. So antivirals, and also, um, people are stockpiling the vaccinia, the smallpox vaccine, basically just in case there's some kind of outbreak. Now, just wanted to cover a couple of things here. Of course, all of you vaccinate, all of you vaccinated your kids, I'm sure of that. Um, but <clears throat> anti-vaccination goes way back. So this is supposed to be Edward Jenner himself, 1812, um, vaccinating all of these poor people. And you see what happens to them? They start to grow cows out of their arms, <laughs> or of their buttocks, or their faces, etc. Um, one thing to bear down, this is very hard to see, but this is a publication of the Anti-Vaccine Society. Um, Anti-vaccination has happened since 1812. So people were really leery about vaccination all the way back um, very, very soon after he started doing this. Um, I'm, this isn't photoshopped at all, I'm sure. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that um, people are still talking about these days. I love this slide. Um, this is one that I got from Mark Slifka, who's out at the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute and the Oregon Primate Research Center out on the West Campus. Uh, this basically shows mortality pre-vaccine versus post-vaccine. Um, these are data from 2011. So we didn't actually have the latest measles outbreaks here. But over 500,000 annual morbidity, i.e. getting sick, from measles before vaccine, and in this particular case in 2011-41. And that's not just true for measles, diphtheria, influenza, hepatitis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Smallpox. Before vaccination, 30,000 a year in the U.S. Now, of course, zero. Uh, just really, really amazing, the progress which has been made um, as far as a lot of these things are concerned. So let's um, take a quick look at how this eradication took place. Uh, 
nice documentary um, put together by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation on pox virus elimination. In the world of virus hunters, this man is a giant. Dr. Donald Henderson accomplished what no man has ever done before. He completely wiped out a virus. And not just any virus, the deadliest and most feared of them all. Smallpox. The virus killed 300 million people in the 20th century alone. And it left millions more disfigured and often blind. It's been said that smallpox has killed more people than all the wars in history combined. Donald Henderson is still haunted by memories of visiting the victims. Their faces were anxious, there were flies all around, some of them were crying, some of them uh, you could see were dying. The odor was just overwhelming, it was like rotting flesh. And the British physician I was with put it on the railing and he said, I can never do that again. I could never do rounds on these patients. That is the most horrible thing I've ever witnessed in my life. The battle against smallpox, in fact the outright war on all infectious diseases, started in earnest at the end of World War II. It was an era of science and progress, a time of confidence. Some would say, there was a tremendous optimism that science was going to protect us and it was going to solve all our problems. Penicillin had just made its debut and this was effective against bacteria. There was a kind of sense that we would have something for viruses soon, if not immediately, and in any case we had vaccines. No one doubted germs would surrender to medical ingenuity. And they did. It seemed like a golden age where many of the diseases we used to fear in the past, like whooping cough, diphtheria, smallpox, polio, all seemed to recede into the woodwork because we could control them. With smallpox and other infections apparently in retreat, research could focus on the remaining disorders, chronic diseases like cancer and heart ailments. These were now the biggest challenge in the war on disease. In 1954, as a newly minted doctor, Donald Henderson was ready. It was a time of optimism. It was a time of delusion. <laughs> it worth great triumphs of public health and great triumphs of science, having these vaccines controlling these one feared and once deadly diseases. But what really happened was sort of more out of sight uh, is out of mind. They were gone only in our thoughts. Transit faces a grim situation. In reality, outside of North America, smallpox was very much alive. In the early 1960s, there were many importations of smallpox into Europe. Part of the reason was there were big outbreaks in India and Pakistan, and they were coming across as visitors or immigrants and starting outbreaks. And I was concerned it was going to happen in the U.S., and we, were, we hadn't had any smallpox for so many years. The world's wealthy nations, where smallpox was a fading memory, now had to face a stark truth. They would never be safe until the virus was destroyed everywhere. In 1966, the World Health Organization selected Donald Henderson as the man to do it. He was under 40, old enough to lead, yet young enough to believe. We were engaged, if you will, in the crusade to do something that had never been done before, but it could be done. When the global eradication program started, there was smallpox in 43 countries. 15 million cases a year. Vaccine was scarce and there was never enough money. All the team had was heart. 
they were young, they were uh, willing to spend incredible amounts of time in the field, they worked very hard, uh, and uh, let's say that they lived from the field. They were not very good at embassy cocktail parties. The virus had one fatal flaw. It existed only in humans. Since no animals carried it, if every human at risk could be vaccinated, smallpox could be beaten. In the first year of the program, Henderson's teams vaccinated over 25 million people on three continents. Smallpox is by far the easiest of all the diseases to eradicate. You need to vaccinate only once and the individual is protected. If you had a vaccine that was very stable, you knew where the smallpox was all the time because everybody who could transmit the disease had a rash, and a very typical rash. There were no silent carriers who could spread it. The team still had to go out and hunt it down. A photo of a baby with smallpox said everything people needed to know to help find the victim. Slowly, one needle at a time, the killer was cornered. By 1977, smallpox survived in just one country in the world, Somalia. And then in just one person, Ali Mao Mellon, a 23-year-old hospital cook in America, was the last natural case of smallpox in the world. It would ironically be a case that should never have happened. He was a young man who had been a vaccinator, but he never got himself vaccinated. Uh, and then he came down with smallpox. And by this time, he had contact, uh, I think the count was about 110 people. Now it was a race against time. A frantic vaccination campaign hit the streets. That one last case meant almost 55,000 people had to be vaccinated, and fast, to avoid disaster. Henderson and his team beat the odds. It was the first time in all of recorded human history that people had actually, with all of the species we have driven to extinction, actually managed to drive an infection, an infectious disease, to extinction. Intentionally. Two years later, the world was officially declared smallpox free. The end of smallpox should not be viewed only as the closing of a magnificent chapter in international collaboration. It should also be seen as one of the launching platforms for our goal for health all by the year 2000. By the year 2000, how did we feel? I suppose as people said, it's, you get to the top of the mountain and it's wonderful. But the fun was in getting there. <laughs> and uh, I think we all realized that we spent a lot of time in the field, a lot of good friends, lived through a lot of bad times together. And it was all over. Donald Henderson's victory was a spectacular exception. Smallpox is still the only virus in the world that's been completely wiped out. The war on infectious diseases had really just begun. And the deadly new viruses would be much more stubborn. Okay, so... <clears throat> That was our little interlude here. Uh, I was also involved in that particular broadcast with the Virus Hunters um, almost 10 years ago now. And the fact that I was even on the same broadcast as Donald Henderson is pretty humbling, to be perfectly honest. Uh, this is me poking around hot springs and yeah, trying to find viruses there. Um, I only heard later that the reason that I was involved in this was that they had all this really cool footage, but not enough for a whole hour, and so they needed the filler, and so I was the filler. <laughs> so, 
Um, but that being said, um, I'll ask a quick question on this. Uh, last known person to have this case of naturally transmitted smallpox was, all of you were listening, vaccinator, doctor, nurse, butcher, or biology professor. Instead of blue. <laughs> <laughs> It starts with B. There was, a, so the guy was a cook, but not a butcher. Uh, and, but a vaccinator, again, the big problem, of course, that had access to all of these people. And so that would, the whole eradication process of smallpox really was one of the very first cases where they were doing all these case tracking and contact tracking. And so again, as you know, they knew the guy who had it, and they knew where he had been, and all of the hundred or so people whom he had interacted with and then they didn't try to vaccinate all around all of those people that's exactly how people went about trying to figure out Ebola and you know quarantine these kinds of people as well and so this is one of the very first cases where case tracking became really really important in terms of connecting to all of these um, all these different people so yes um, this is the correct answer Okay, so now, as I've mentioned before, we'll talk about the interesting stuff, right, the molecular aspects of what's going on with not so much variola, but vaccinia, because we understand vaccinia much, much better. Again, it's not obviously a cow virus, probably a horse virus or something else. Uh, there are a couple of things, again, just having to do with the virion, big, complex, etc., Lots and lots and lots of proteins are there. No, I don't expect you to remember all 100 of them. Um, but they're a really large number, in fact, the largest number that we've looked at so far, of different proteins that are being packaged in a particular virion. These virions are big, um, 300 by 250 by 150 approximately, and the genome is the largest one that we've looked at so far, 200,000 base pairs um, in terms of actual genome. The genome looks a little bit like this. I drew up this cartoon myself. Um, here's our uh, so linear, quote unquote, genome, but with these um, covalently closed ends. Inverted terminal repeats. That should sound familiar based on what virus we just talked about a couple lectures ago. Inverted terminal repeats. So herpes does, but it's multiple different pieces in it. Adeno also has the inverted terminal repeats. So it's really not at all unusual that we have these inverted terminal repeats. And we'll see why that is, again, probably mostly having to do with virus replication a little bit later on. Uh, they're big, however. These are 10,000 base pair inverted terminal repeats. They're not exact, but they're very close to that. And of that, about 4,000 of these bases are non-coding. either. don't seem to be coding for a protein. And as you remember, in the herpes virus, a lot of these repeated sequences um, had encoded proteins in them. Um, this is true to a little extent here in the, in the pox viruses, but mostly not. So let's zoom in and look at some of those ends here. Um, here are, so this is uh, tens of thousands of bases. So you remember, this is that 10,000, which is repeated at either end. The 4,000 at the very end of the genome is not protein coding but it has multiple repeats. And these are the tandem repeats here, tandem direct repeats. So these are identical sequences. Um, and each of the vertical lines here actually represents um, those sequences. And 
probably what this means is that they're really good at base pairing with each other. And so if we zoom in yet again to this part of the genome right here, this is what the very end of the genome looks like. Almost completely base paired. All of these guys sticking out here are the non-base paired pieces. And then four bases at the end to go from one strand around to the other strand. So this really is a monomolecular genome because it's hooked up. One continuous circle. Um, phosphodiester bonds all the way around uh, the whole genome. And we can ignore this thing down at the bottom right here um, for the time being. And it's just the opposite end of the genome. Uh, you can see here that this is also complementary. We go A-A-A-T. It's T-T-T-A. So again, completely complementary ends to each other. Um, again, these inverted terminal repeat structures. Uh, they're not completely uh, base paired with each other. You see a couple of these, again, sticking out. But they're identical on the opposite strand. So if here an A is stuck out, the opposite end is going to be a T, which is stuck out um, relative to these individual sequences. So uh, very, very highly complementary sequences at either end. Again, probably important for replication um, that we'll get back to in a second. How does replication take place? Through a bunch of replication genes. I don't expect you to remember the names of all of these, but there are a couple of important aspects about these particular proteins. One is that these genes are all mixed up. They're on both strands. Um, you'll have core proteins. This is a clearly a late protein. Some of the DNA replication proteins, which are clearly early proteins, all mixed together. So there's not like one clear segment of early genes and late genes. This is early genes, late genes, everything all kind of mixed up together on both of the two different strands of the genome. And the genome here is just split up uh, based on, historically speaking, pieces of the genome of different size when you cut with restriction and nuclease in D3. Talk about a crazy way of doing nomenclature. So the fourth largest piece is the D piece, now A, B, C, D, and then each of those ones is numbering from one end over to the other, D1 which is on the rightward facing, D2 is leftward facing, D3 is rightward facing, etc. So again, completely crazy nomenclature. Um, what important are what are the activities of some of these genes that we'll get back to um, in just a second. So these are some of the genes that are present in the genome. What are they encapsulated in? These two different kinds of particles, all of which have the same core structure, and that's shown here, if I can get my pointer to work on it. Um, this core structure kind of looks a bit like a, a figure eight or a dumbbell here. You can actually see these in the electron microscope. Um, this core structure and then, quote, lateral bodies on the outside because they need another name for them. But the important thing is this is all protein. Remember those you know, 100 different proteins that are all put together? They're all sort of squished together into these structures in the middle whether they've got these tubes in the middle here, as it's kind of anybody's guess. These are all, this is very much a guesstimate here of the structure. This, um, the sort of the figure eight structure does seem to be really common in these, um, particularly vaccinia, and I think the other pox viruses as well. So this structure right here has a single membrane around the outside and virus envelope proteins in a pretty normal fashion. This particular, <clears throat> Virion is extremely stable. Um, and this is what people call the mature virion. This is what's in the scab. This is why you can actually do variolation. You can get this particular active virion and get infection. Um, what's interesting is if you purify virions from cell culture usually or for, from infected animals, um, you also see this really bizarre, what they call the extracellular mature virus, which has two membranes around the outside. So it's basically this particle with yet another membrane around the outside. And what it seems that this is extra membrane around the outside is not so much important in getting infection from organism to organism, which is why you want to have something that's nice and stable. But once you're inside <coughs> one particular organism and cell to cell or tissue to tissue transport. And we'll see how that happens hopefully at the end today with some 
really cool videos as well. A video full lecture today of, of how these things are moving literally from cell to cell and actually inside the cell. So how does a virion actually have motility? Um, it's a neat process that we'll get to in just a second here. So the replication process is pretty well understood. We have these, and this should actually be a mature virion. It's the old version of the textbook, uh, which then has a single membrane around the outside, comes into the cell, could be by fusion at the plasma membrane, could be coming into endosomes, and the core structure is released here. Now remember, this is all of these proteins. Um, and the proteins which are here, again, not unlike what you see in the tegument, are important for expressing more of the early proteins. And so these are literally, again, the proteins which are here, they're packaged in the virion, they're active when you have infection that takes place, and these proteins are involved in getting DNA replication to take place. DNA replication then allows for transcription. These are intermediate messenger RNAs, making intermediate proteins, late proteins, etc. Once you've made all of these things, they end up forming in intracellular vesicles. Again, very similar to a lot of other viruses that we've talked about so far. In those vesicles, they undergo maturation. We end up with these core structures, which will then become enveloped and then released on the outside. One thing to notice here, is there any interaction with the nucleus whatsoever? No, but this is a DNA virus. What does that mean? About, it's got all of its own stuff. Exactly. So let's look at some of the stuff that's in here. RNA polymerase. This is a DNA dependent RNA polymerase, multi subunit enzyme, not at all unlike the case for the cellular polymerases, multi subunit DNA dependent RNA polymerases. There are transcription stimulation factors, early gene specificity factors. There are capping enzymes, there are termination enzymes, there are polydenylation enzymes, there's helicases, both RNA helicases and DNA helicases. All of these things are in the virion. So they're coming along with everything that you need. So you just have the virion comes in, the envelope comes off, you have your own RNA polymerase, which can now start transcribing the genes that you need for later processes. What's the standard later process that you need? Your early genes. And it'd be what? Early genes you need for replication of your genome. So what are those? Again, bringing pretty much all of its own machinery with it. DNA polymerase. DNA pro polymerase processivity factor. Sliding clamp. Topoisomerase. The same strand of DNA binding proteins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the way down here. We talked about thymidine kinases and ribonucleotide reductases last time because most cells are not making lots of the precursors that you need to make DNA replication. What do you do? You have thymidine kinase and ribonucleotide reductase to so take those RNAs and convert them into DNAs. So you can make all of that process. Yeah? So is it still taking from the stock of RNA in the cytoplasm of the cell? So yeah, so it's, it's using RNAs in the cytoplasm of the cell. The whole replication process takes place in the cytoplasm. It has nothing to do with the nucleus at all. Yeah, Luke? Um, are these in, uh, novel at all compared to cellular? Um, we'll get back to that in just a second, but the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah? Does a virion having all of these proteins with it, does that make a virus more transmissible? So, again, this is getting back to the question that Trevor asked, asked right at the beginning, <laughs> is if you have something that's got all of its own machinery, or almost all of its own machinery, wouldn't you expect it to have a really, really wide host range? Uh, and the answer is, at least for variola, no. Quite why that is, I don't know. I'm going to try and find out. It may not be known, <laughs> but you would, it's exactly the opposite of what you'd expect. Um, although I should say that these genes here, um, all of these DNA enzymes, 
These are actually being made once you come in. So these are actually not in the virion. All the transcriptional regulatory proteins are present in the virion. So these are actually being made as a second step. And how those get made um, have to do with transcriptional regulators. So again, they're not unlike all of the cellular processes. You have all these transcriptional regulators. But now these are viral transcriptional regulators. Um, there's the early transcription factors, the intermediate transcription factors, and the late transcription factors, all of which are viral. Again, horrible nomenclature here, but at least that's the... <clears throat> uh, here, the early transcription factors, an early transcription factor has to be present in the virion, again, like all the RNA polymerases. In order to be able to get those intermediate and late proteins, you have to have all of this machinery available there. Um, all of the activity of these intermediate transcriptions and late transcription factors is after replication. So early transcription factors, again, making all the early genes, including all of the DNA polymerases, topoisomerases, et cetera. And of course, everything is happening now in the cytoplasm. Getting back to your question, Luke, about what's going on in terms of these different proteins, um, clearly these transcriptional regulators are analogous to the general transcription factors that you have in normal RNA polymerase II, but clearly very different in terms of their sequence and their structure to some extent as well. Um, so you don't have Tata binding protein. You don't have TF2D. You have early transcription factors, intermediate transcription factors, and late transcription factors here. Um, and they do, however, serve to modify the structure of the DNA allow binding of the RNA polymerase in manners very similar to what happens in RNA polymerase II. And you've got all of your capping and poly tailing enzymes. This is the only virus that I know of that encodes its own poly A polymerase. So instead of the stuttering process, it actually has its own poly A polymerase, particularly for the early genes. Turns out for late genes, it does things slightly differently. Um, but we'll get to that in just a second if we actually get there. Um, did, however, want to talk about replication. Um, this has to do with those structures that you have at either end of the genome. You remember almost completely base paired with each other. Um, here they've emphasized the loop, um, which is present at one end. What seems to happen with replication is you have an endonuclease, which will cut this loop structure. We have an endonuclease that cuts. Now you're going to have a 3 OH and a template. You remember these guys also encode their own DNA and RNA helicases. So now this provides a nice template for the DNA polymerase. It can replicate its way out to the end of the genome. Remember, these are inverted terminal repeat structures and have multiple repeats, which means they can come around and bind back to themselves. They come around and bind back to themselves. Now you have a 3 OH and a template. This will replicate its way all the way down to the end of the genome and ends up making these concatenates. So you've got multiple copies of the genome all hooked up together end to end to end. And those, of course, you've got to chop into smaller pieces and make those. But that chopping, instead of what we see in terms of things like herpes virus or the bacteriophage, we're going to cut a very specific place and then package each of those individual genomes. Here, the cutting seems to be a ligase reaction where you're cutting and then re-ligating back together to make this nice circular single molecule genome. Um, this should seem very similar to what's going on with the parvoviruses because they have these structures at the end of the genome, which have three prime OHs that can be extended out to the opposite end. So this is the process whereby people think that this is going on. The late messenger RNAs are actually a little different in terms of making poly A's because they have what appears to be a stuttering-like process. So not just a poly A polymerase, but also stuttering processes, which should sound very similar to what kinds of poly A tail formation? So we've got two weeks to the exam. I don't need to bother, bother about this yet. The negative strand RNA viruses that we were talking about that are making their RNA dependent RNA polymerases. And then some of the termination sites um, end up getting read through as well. 
So uh, we'll see how we do on this clicker question, uh, <laughs> given your answers to the last one. Poly tail formation by vaccinia is most similar to that by polio, Zika, Ebola, SARS, or HPV-16. And I should say this is of the late genes. Not the early genes. What's our negative strand virus? <laughs> Ebola. Um, I very carefully had to correct this when I talked about the poly tail formation because HPV-16 actually uses the cellular poly A polymerase, which is probably similar to the poly A polymerase that comes from the virus there. So um, I'll find out who had E here, and I'll try and give them credit. So. Uh, but yes, the answer that I was looking for um, is Ebola because of the negative strand aspect of things. Okay, let's finish up talking about how you make these things. Uh, as I hopefully mentioned when we went through that cartoon, um, first you make all of your early proteins. It's going to replicate your genome. Those then start the late proteins to be expressed. Those late proteins start to make structural proteins, and those then assemble together with all these vesicles. And that's what this EM is supposed to be showing here. So here's the, so again, eh, my pointer will eventually work here. Uh, here's, the, here's the nucleus. Um, notice everything's replicating outside the nucleus. Um, here are all of the core structures spitting off their proteins and doing their thing, then starting to associate with these vesicles. These vesicles then eventually undergo maturation and get these membranes around the outside of them. Again, this is a little bit easier to see in the cartoon process. Here's the production of the viruses in these vesicles on the outside. They go through the Golgi where they pick up the membrane which is on the outside here. This is your mature virion. Um, here are the intracellular mature virion. With this one membrane, this is now a cellular membrane on the outside. If this guy were to fuse with the plasma membrane, you now have a virion with one membrane on the outside. If, however, you get another membrane put around this virus, it can be released with two membranes on the outside. This would be your enveloped virus. This is the one which is important for going from cell to cell, and this is the one which is important from going from organism to organism. And then just to finish up, I wanted to show you this um, image here, which is how virus particles seem to be able to move from cell to cell. Um, and how that happens is they stimulate polymerization of actin behind the virus particles. And that's what's shown down here um, at the bottom. These are individual virions in red and the green actin polymerizing behind them. That's an electron micrograph here. And this can literally move these virus particles around. Let's uh, take a quick look now at this. Um, so these are green ones are the vaccinia virions, and red is the polymerization of actin behind them. 